Then there is a crew assertion check, which is just a UBI and not a list. Uh, exactly the same type as you have seen from the performance rate. Then relation algebra, first one is trivial, the second one is the same as which bank issue one card, right? Or which dealer, uh, or which shop offer this product at the highest price, the same as those two problems. The last one is two divisions. Then SQL, first one again is trivial, second one again is trivial, second one is just division. And there are two ways of doing division. The last one is a little bit tricky, but it's actually it's not that tricky at all, comparing to what you had done in your homework thread. Okay? Right. So that's, that's kind of neat. I will go over the detail of this. Um, when uh, when I finish grading the, uh, the midterm, okay? Now today, we're gonna go over a couple of things, really important things. First of all, I wanna finish the discussion on normal form by going over the definition of certain normal form. Then I will use the remaining part of this lecture to talk about GSP, web programming, and how you get started with your phase three, okay? So some of you may have web programming experience, some of you may not have any web programming experience, but trust me, it's not hard at all, at least the basics of it. So even if you have zero knowledge of web programming, after today's lecture you will be somewhat, uh, not necessarily an expert, but you know how to navigate that space, okay? after today's lecture. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Third normal form. So why we need another normal form? Okay. Uh, to talk about third normal form, first of all, I hope you still remember there's something called BCNF. I know there's a break, there was a midterm, tons of things happened, there was a trade war, and a lot of stuff happened. <laughs> right? But there is something called BCNF. That's to stay. Okay. All right, so there is something called BCNF. And to remind you what BCNF does, in a nutshell, there are two ways you, you need to understand BCNF. One is the definition of it. The second angle is what's the implication of that definition? Why you define BCNF in that particular form, okay? The mechanical way of understanding BCNF, or the literal way of understanding BCNF, is by the definition of this particular normal form. All it says is every functional dependency you have for a schema must be a key functional dependency, a key constraint, meaning that the left hand side is either a key or super key. And that's the only type of functional dependency that's allowed on a schema that's in BCNF. Fairly easy, straightforward definition. Okay, just check all your functional dependencies, and every single one of them must be a key constraint. That's it. Left hand side must be a key or super key. If you have at least one functional dependency that does not satisfy this requirement, then the given schema is not in BC enough. Okay, that's what we said. So that's the first angle of understanding BCNF. The second aspect you really need to understand is why we define BCNF in this particular form. Why not some other form? Why we need to define BCNF in this particular definition? Well, the reason for that is this allows no redundancy for that schema. No redundancy at all. Meaning that it will get rid of insertion deletion of the anomaly 100%, which is demonstrated using the simple example here, okay? So that's you know, basically what you need to know about BCNF. Then to give you a recap, what we said afterwards is, okay, what if a schema is not in BCNF? Then you need to decompose that into BCNF schemas if your objective is to have no redundancy in your design meaning that you don't have to worry about insertion and deletion of the anomaly at the application level code. In your application level code. If you don't, if you don't worry about any of those, 
then you need to decompose your schema into a set of smaller schemas that do satisfy easy enough requirements. Of course, another way to argue about this is I will leave my schema as whatever it is, like a well west. Then I enforce those anomalies at my application level, like in Java code, in your GSP, and things like that. For simple applications, this is doable. But for complex applications with multiple schemas, this quickly becomes auto control, as you can imagine. It's really hard to keep track of those different kind of anomalies at application level code. Does that make sense? So you do decomposition of your schema, then we talk about how do we decompose a schema in such a way that, that is both lossless strong and dependency preserving decomposition. Lossless decomposition means that after decomposing an input schema, the resulting schemas, if you join them back, you always get the instance for the original schema. You don't lose any record, you don't introduce any record that does not exist there in the first place. You get exactly the same instance back. And that's what we call a lossless decomposition. And we have a particular result that facilitates you to both check whether a given decomposition is lossless, and given a schema, how do you perform a lossless Right, the x, y, x intercept y determine x or determine y, and the resulting lemma of it, that's essentially what we talk about there. Right? And then we also talk about what's, what we mean by dependency preserving decomposition. Well, the idea is if you decompose r into two smaller schemas, r1 and r2, you first find out the projection of functional dependencies on r1 and r2, where the projection is done we do that to the closure of f rather than f itself. Then you check if the union of those give you the original function dimension, set of function dimension back. If it does, then it is dependency preserving, otherwise it is not. So those basically what we had been talking about leading to the midterm, right? Like two lectures preceding the midterm. Just give you a quick recap. And the critical and we also talk about you know, the algorithm for you to decompose a schema into a set of smaller schemas if it's not already in BCNF. The idea is essentially you recursively apply that decom the lossless strong decomposition algorithm. You just recursively apply that until all your schemas are in BCNF. That's it. However, a negative result, and we didn't prove, but people know this in the literature, is that lossless strong and dependency preserving decomposition of a schema that's not in BCNF is not always possible. Meaning that given a schema that is not already in BCNF, and if your goal is to decompose this into a smaller, a set of smaller schemas, such that each of those is in BCNF, and the decomposition must be lossless and dependency preserving, this is not always possible. Sometimes it is doable, sometimes this is not possible. That's the negative result we have. So that's where we stop, right before the midterm test. Okay? So just to give you a quick summary of where we were. Now, that means that naturally the next question to ask is what do we do in that case? What do you do in that case? Like if you reach a dead end. You, you have a schema that's not in BCNF, and you try to decompose it, and your decomposition fails because it cannot give you lossless strong and dependency preserving at the same time. What do you do? Right? That's kind of a natural question to ask. Right? In that case, obviously, the most natural solution is to relax your requirement. Is to relax your requirement. Instead of trying to get BCNF, you may want to relax your requirement to another normal form that's not as strict as BCNF. In other words, you allow some level of redundancy to exist, but you are careful in selecting what type of redundancy you do allow while you're relaxing the requirements of BCNF. 
And that normal form is what we're going to talk about today. It's called the third normal form. Third normal form, you know, essentially as I just said, is a relaxation of BCNF. And this relaxation is critical because by relaxing BCNF in this particular way, which we're going to define in a minute, how do you relax BCNF to get third normal form? But by, by relaxing BCNF requirement in this particular fashion, you get a critical result. The, the result is the following, which is it's always, always, 100% possible to decompose an input schema that's not in BCNF into a set of smaller schemas that are in BCNF. And the decomposition is both loss withdrawn and dependency withdrawing. This is always possible in contrast to BCNF decomposition. You follow this? So this is always possible. Okay. And that being said, you know, there are a couple of questions for us to answer. One is, what is the normal form? What's the definition of the normal form? What is that relaxation I've been talking about in respect to BCNF? That's question number one. Question number two is, once that definition is given, once that relaxation is given, how do you perform your decomposition such that it's lossless and dependency preserved? Right? Those are the two questions we need to answer. In the interest of time and in the interest of scope of this, this course, I will talk about only question number one, meaning the definition of the normal form and what is that relaxation with respect to BCNF. I will not talk about the decomposition of a schema into the normal form because that decomposition is fairly involved. The algorithm is fairly involved. And uh, if you're interested, but I do have that in my slides. If you're interested, you can go ahead and do it yourself. But that's not required as part of this course. In your work, that later on in your career, if you end up being a database developer or database administrator, or even better, you become a person who design database kernels. In the very least, you need to understand what the third normal form is. You don't necessarily need to know how the decomposition into third normal form is. Uh, because that, in most commercial database engines, they package that well, that translates to just one button. They trigger the algorithm and run that for you. And, but I, in the very least, you need to understand what the normal form is. You follow that? Okay? So with that being said, let's, you know, let's look at the definition of the normal form. And I, I will explain just a little bit, first of all, the definition of the normal form. Uh, again, just like BCNF, there are two ways you need to uh, fully understand with regard to third normal form. One is the literal definition of third normal form. Third normal form meaning, the, you know, just memorizing, you know, what third normal form means, the definition of it. The second aspect is once you know the definition of third normal form, you need to fully understand why that's the case. So to, to give you an analogy, analogy to this, right? to give you a metaphor of what I'm saying is, it's kind of like when you are first introduced to a car, somebody will define, oh, a car has four wheels. You probably don't understand why a car has four wheels, but you will remember that definition. And later on, once you start driving a car, you start to appreciate the fact that a car needs to have four wheels. Otherwise, it cannot maintain balance. And even better, later on you know the front wheel is to still steer the direction, the, the wheel wheel is to provide the support and balance. You see what I'm saying, right? There, for any definition, there are always two things. One is what the definition is. The second aspect, why it's defined that way. For science subjects, for science and engineering subjects. Also, science and engineering definition is defined the way it is. Don't ask me why. For example, why 
you know, a particular historical event happened in that year. Or well, it just happened that year. Right? But for science and engineering subject, every single definition is defined in that way for a particular reason. So not only you need to memorize what the definition is, really important you need to understand why it is defined that way. Right? For example, BCNF, you know, it's a for simple only key constraints. Why that's why you define this way? Because this gets rid of any redundancy you have. Okay? So we will try to do that, do the same for certain number You follow, follow me? That being said, okay, let's fast forward my slides. So this is we talk about decomposition, lossless, and this important results, how you check whether a decomposition is lossless, and then the useful lemma for you to apply uh, to decompose the relation. WZ lemma. Right? And then we define dependency preserving. Uh, there's an example of how do you apply this to get BCNF decompositions. And at the end of it, there's a summary of why, you know, not why, but the fact that it's not always possible to do that. Right? That's essentially what you know the recap just gave you. Now let's look at third normal form. You know, the first observation you have, given what I said is the following key observation. Right? What I said is, third normal form is a relaxation of BCNF. What can you derive from that claim? Third normal form is a relaxation of BCNF. An important implication of that is if a given schema satisfies BCNF requirement, then it must satisfy also, third normal form requirement. Why is the relaxation of third normal form? It's kind of like if you consider yourself as an athlete, like you are a sprinter or whatever, and if your record is good enough to participate in the national level, in the Olympic level competition, obviously you're going to be good enough to participate in the national level competition. It's a relaxation. Does that make sense? So if something is already in BCNF, then it must also be in third normal form. The other way, of course, is not true, right? If something is in third normal form, it may or may not be in BCNF. With that being said, let's look at the definition and find out what is that relaxation. First of all, the definition is very similar to BCNF in the sense that you check every single functional dependency from the closure of the input functional dependencies on a schema R. Then every functional dependency must be one of the followings. Every single functional dependency must be one of the followings. First of all, it can be a key constraint, meaning that the second condition here. The left hand side x, by the way, x can be either a single attribute or multiple attributes. The left hand side x is a super key. Super key includes key and super key. A key by definition automatically is a super key. Okay? So the left hand side is a key or super key. In that case, this function dependency is fine with respect to certain one form. Or it's a trivial function dependency, meaning that the right hand side is a subset of x. If you look at the first two conditions, they are identical to the BCNF requirement. So far, good. The first two conditions. The right hand side is a subset of left hand side, or the left hand side is a super key. These two are identical to BCNF requirement. If you look at we run back to the definition of BC enough. Right? The first two conditions of third normal form are identical to the first two conditions of BC enough. And it's critical to note that the two conditions are all together, are not and. Meaning you only need to satisfy one of the two conditions. You don't have to satisfy both. You follow me? So how do you relax this? If, if there is a condition that's A or B, how can you further relax this? Relax this condition. Well, if you keep adding another all term, 
That's a relaxation of this. Let's call this condition two. And condition one is A or B. Then no matter what A, B, C, by the way, A, B, C are Boolean expressions, Boolean expressions. No matter what those Boolean conditions are, condition two is always a relaxation of of condition one. Right? This is a trivial observation, right? I hope you can see this. Can someone argue to me why? Why this is a trivial case? Why this is a trivial statement? Why condition two is always a relaxation of condition one? Because it adds one more constraint, but sometimes, but if that's what if that's what is that's the reason, isn't it the case that it's it's more intuitive to say adding more constraint will make it more restricted than relaxing it, right? Typically, if you if, if what you said is true, intuitively adding more constraint is to make it more restricted rather than relaxing it, right? Why is the case? Yeah, because the critical observation is you are, you are adding another constraint using the or condition. Meaning that, so condition two can be rewritten as condition one or C. So I view condition one as a black box. I just replace that part from condition two as that black box. So whenever condition one is true, because this is all, then condition two is true always. In sports, condition two must be a relaxation of condition one. And also, you see that? Yes or no? One or anything is always one. That's the key observation, okay? However, if condition one is false, meaning zero, I still have a chance of being one, right? Because if this anything is one, then I'm the whole thing is still true, meaning that if you look at this, what I tell you is condition two has more space to be true than condition one is. But whenever condition one is true, condition two always true. King's fourth condition two must be a relaxation of condition one, right? So this is simple you know, logic uh, reasoning, okay? So that means that, com coming back to third number four, and this is clearly, a relaxation of B, C, and F, right? Because the first two conditions are identical to B, C, and F, that's A or B. Then I add a third condition, or together with A or B, it's kind of like A or B or C. Per the discussion we just had, this must be a relaxation of B, C, and F. You follow me? All of you? And let's look at what's that third term, meaning that what's, what's this term C here? Right? Term C is, for a certain number form, is what? Is, okay, by the way, if you have A or B or C, you only need to check the third term if both the first terms are false. If one of the first two terms are already true, do you need to check the third term? You don't. As long as one of A or B is true already, you don't worry about C at all. So you only check about term C, the third condition, if and only if the first two conditions are false. Meaning that, what, what are they imply? That means it must not be in B, C, and F at that point. Right? Otherwise, if one of the first two conditions is true, then the schema is at least with back to this particular function of dependency, the schema is in BCN. At least with that to this particular function of dependency. Okay? So you only check the third condition if the first two conditions are false. Meaning, by that point, that function of dependency has already violated the BCN requirement. Okay, what's that third condition? Well, let's look at this together. The condition is 
given x between a and found with respect to schema r, okay? By the way, this a is attribute, not the same as b or b or c, right? Maybe I should, don't confuse you here, I should call this term 1, term 2, and term 3, okay? 3 Boolean terms, okay? And this is essentially, you know, the given function that you need to check. And what's that term 3? Term 3 says, by this, by this point, term, both term 1 and term 2 are false. What that means, that means A is not part of X, it's not a trivial function of dependency, and X is not a super key. Right? Follow this? So what's term 3? The, the condition says Okay, at this point, I know A is not part of X, and X is not a super key. Must be the case, otherwise I don't even have to check term 3. And term 3 says, then A is part of some candidate key. Meaning that, okay, there exists a candidate key, Let's, let me call that Z, or R, such that A is part of V. A is part of V. So that's the third condition. There is one candidate key V. V, by the way, this is a symbol, right? Representing either a single or multiple attributes. You follow me? And this A on the right hand side is a subset of that candidate key. If that's the case, then we claim this functional dependency satisfy the third normal form requirement. Otherwise, it is not. Otherwise, it is not. So, so that's the definition of it. Right? At this point, just memorizing the definition. Next, I'm going to explain to you the intuition behind this definition. Why we define thermal form in this particular form. And it's, by the way, it's critical to remember that this Z here must be a candidate key instead of a super key. And this is critical, right? If I replace this with super key, then the third condition is as if doesn't exist at all. Why? Because a trivial super key is all attributes of your schema. And in that case, A, this attribute A must be a subset of the schema. So the third condition is true always. If you relax that to be super key, then the third condition is always true. Because there, there is always at least one super key which is everything that covers your right hand side. So that's trivially true all the time. That makes sense? So it's really important to note that the right hand side must be a subset of candidate key rather than a super key. Let me give you now an example to try to understand why we define this in this particular way. Okay, let's, let's assume that We have this uh, reserve table, right? We, we, we all know this reserve table, right? Sailors, boat, and date. Sailor ID, boat ID, and date, we reserve that. Right? <coughs> Remember this schema we said? Which sailor reserve which boat on which date? That's happening in Wonderland. Uh, that only happened in Wonderland. Why? In practice, as far as I know, you always have to pay. Even if it's free for you, somebody has to give you a trade. So in reality, and this happened only in Wonderland, in reality you need to provide a credit card. 
or some sort, right? And some payment form. So let's make this schema a little bit more real as you find in real applications. So you add a credit card to it, attribute. So this, that's why we have SVDC for this schema R. So that's my schema. So far so good? So far so good? Yes? And let's say we have a tribute, we obviously we have one, you know, naturally we have a functional dependency that says as determined C. Can someone explain to me what this functional dependency means? What what does as determined C tell you? The say we will only ever have one credit card. Say again? A saver will only ever be a saver would have only one credit card. Uh, to to avoid any confusion, I will quali I will further qu uh, qualify what you said to the following, which is a sailor only use one credit card for reservation purposes. Because when you say a, a sailor has only one credit card, that's, that's confusing. Do you mean he or she has on only one credit card in his or her entire life, or only with respect to this application? Does that, that make sense? So we need to restrict that to only this particular table, meaning that a sailor may have multiple credit cards, but I don't care. For reservation purposes, I, ins I enforce that you only use one credit card, always. Why you do this? Sailor Club does this all the time, right? If you, know, if you are a club member of some sort, they ask you to use one credit card for all your transactions. That's normal. That's what this is asking. Do all of you follow this? Why that's the case? Why this function doesn't say tell you that? Can you explain? Why, Why you said what you said? Well, because you would be able to determine a uh, unique credit card from, from a sailor. Uh, that's the literal interpretation of this function dependency, right? If you go a little bit further to understand what's going on, is to say that for any two records from this schema, if the sailor ID are the same, what can you claim about the credit card? It must be the same credit card. Henceforth, that implies you use the same credit card always for the same sailor. So we tell you this is 101, serial 101, and this credit card. What can you tell about this value here? If you have this function dimension, you know this must be this, mm -hmm. nothing else. And henceforth, what he said is true. Okay? All of you follow this? So far, so good? Now, let's check. Back. You know, if you remember the discussion from the beginning of this, this, this course, we said this, the primary key of reserve is what? The primary key of the reserve is sailor ID, boat ID, and date. So that the same sailor can reserve the same boat multiple times on different dates. You follow that? that was the, that's the primary key of this. Henceforth, you also have your functional dependency, your F. Essentially, is SBD determines what? Well, actually, you don't have to. You don't have to see that, right? If you give an S determines C, can you claim that this give you SBD is the key? Does this give you this? Can someone tell me how to prove this? If I give you S determine C, can you show that S B D is the key? If that's the only functional dependency you have on this schema. Suppose that's the only functional dependency you have on this schema. You follow at least, do you understand at least what the question is? Can you show me that's the case? I mean, this is important to understand, by the way. If you guys want to become a database developer, and you go work for some sailor club, your boss tell you, oh, sailor determine credit card. And then ask you what's the key of this table. You can answer that. What's the key of this table? I, I'm telling you the key is SVD, but I'm asking you to prove that. Go ahead. So you could do it by augmentation. You could do SVD. Well, you can add BD on both sides of the first. So, yes, you can do that, but the trip, easier way is to use the attribute closure of SVD. You start with SVD, 
the quota of SVD is just SVD itself, right? Then you keep adding to the right hand side that whatever can be determined by the current closure, given that S determines C, you can always add C to this. You can expand the closure within the attribute C, then you're done. Now you show SVD is a super key, and the fact that you only have S determined C means that none of the subset of SVD can determine everything else. You're done. That's the key. You follow this? Yeah? And of proof. Okay? Are good? Okay, that's the key. Now, given these two facts, okay, I want to ask you the following. Is R, the first question I'm going to ask you is R in B, C, and F? Is R in B, C, and F? How many of you know the answer? If you know the answer, can you tell me why? By the way, this skill is really, really important, right? What we're doing here is nothing else but like, you are given a set of contracts, and then I'm kind of like running a legal battle against you. Like, given this set of contract, is this allowed? Is this allowed? Is this allowed? If you don't want to pay a lawyer all your money, you better be able to deduct that yourself. Does that make sense? Or you are super rich one day, then you don't have to worry about this. You hire some but I'm for lawyers, and did that this for you. Does that make sense? You disagree with that statement, but that's fine. <laughs> I am a lawyer, please. You're a lawyer, okay. Cool. Can I get a discount from you next time? <laughs> so I'm, I'm serious. I hope that you know it's recorded, right? You cannot say no later on. <laughs> on the record. That's a trap. Okay, so can someone argue this for me? Yes or no? Make a guess. You have 50% chance of being right, right? How many say this is in BC enough? This is in BC enough. How many say this is not in BC enough? Okay, this is not in BC enough. I can tell you the answer. Can someone tell me why this is not in BC enough? Can you tell me? Slow, slow down, so the rest of us can follow you. You'll have, I mean, you have three keys right there. You have three keys. You only have one key, by the way. Well, this is the one key. You have three, like, three fields. Kind of. Oh, three I see what you're saying. So but you'll have, like, redundancy three. Like, kind of. You, you're kind of on the right direction, but I'm leaving a little bit. Let's check, okay, together. What What is really the condition for PCNF? Can someone tell me? What's the condition for these now? There are only two conditions, right? For any, for any, what you, what you need to satisfy is either A is a subset of X or X is a super key. Right? So that's the condition of these now. Let's just check that. I have this functional dependency. And this is my x, this is my a. Huh? S is my x, c is my a. Is c a subset of s? Is c a subset of s? Obviously not. So the first condition is not true. Is s a super key? Clearly not. For s to be super key, this has to be s, b, d, c. Obviously that's not the case. The attribute closure is just s and c. S determine itself and C. That's it. You don't determine anything else. So the second condition is also force. So now of the condition is true, then this must not be in B C now. Right? Another way to understand why this is not in B C is to go back to the example I just erased. For the same sailor. This is redundancy right there. 
you are scoring this redundancy. If you spot any kind of redundancy, you know it's not in BC now. You follow me? So, okay, this is not in BC now. No. Okay? Good. Huh? Second trickier question is R in third normal form. R in third normal form. So third normal form has three conditions, I'd argue, right? The first two are identical to B, C, and F, which we know this functional dependency does not satisfy those two conditions. So you can skip checking those two. Well, the first two are identical to B, C, and F requirement. And so you go straight to check condition number three. You follow me? You follow what I said? What is that condition number three? The right-hand side, is the subset of some candidate key. In our case, what's our right hand side? What's A? A is C. A is a symbol, X is a symbol, right? In our case, X is S, A is C. So all I need to check is what? What do I need to check? What's, what's inside here, which is, it boils down to C. Contained by some candidate key. By the way, candidate key it can be of you know by some key actually to be precise. Because you may you may be confused now. Oh, candidate key means that it does does not include primary key. Uh, any key. That's the point here. Any key. Okay. Primary key or candidate key. But cannot be a super key. Any key. All you need to check is C contained by some key of your schema. You follow me? Let's check. That's why this problem is tricky. This is actually a perfect example of that. If you look at what we have done so far, we know SBD is a key. And C is not part of that key. You may derive the wrong conclusion, okay, C is not part of SBD. So this is a force. So this statement is force, you, and you, you, you get the conclusion that this is not an insert normal form. Because at this point, all three conditions have failed, this is not insert normal Do you follow me? But be careful. Be careful. Let's look at if SBD is the key, do you have other keys? Do you have other keys in this case? In this case, no, you don't have other keys. So this is not in zero form. Okay? However, in reality, there is another implied functional dependency. What is that? A credit card is associated with how many people? As far as I know, credit card is associated with your social security number. Right? So there's another functional dependency, which is, you know, if you're at FBI and then you see one particular credit card number, you will be able to find who that person is. What does it tell you? Is there another functional dependency here? Huh? There's another functional dependency, C determine S. For the same credit card value, S I D must be the same. It must be the same person. If you look, if you understand, if you try to understand, let me finish and then I'll take the question. If you try to understand the two constraints here, this is really an application specific constraint, meaning that a sitter indeed can have multiple credit cards. So in the general setting, you, you actually do not have this functional dependency. However, I, as a sailor club owner, I limit any sailor to use just one credit card for all reservation transactions. So that's an application-specific constraint. You follow me? If you go to another sailor club, this may not be the case. They may allow you to use multiple different credit cards for different transactions. You follow me? 
So that's an application specific constraint. This C determining S, if you think about it, is really a universal constraint. As, as far as you know, US is concerned, because that's determined by the federal law. Each credit card is associated with one social security number. Only one social security number. So from credit card number, you can determine who that person is. That's a universal constraint. It's independent of applications. Do you follow me? Yes? OK, now, given this new information, let's come back and check the same statement. Is C contained by some key? OK? And that will answer this as well. Is R in certain normal form or not? You follow me? Yeah? Let's check this together. First of all, C still does not belong to SVD. But the question is, given this new information, is SVD still the only key you have? Is SVD the only key you have? CBD, if you look at the closure of this, start with CBD. But as soon as you have CBD to the S, you can expand this with S. Because CBD can be this, so you can expand this. So that's another key right there. So you have two keys, SBD and CBD. At this point, yes, you, you do not have this, but you, you have this. So answer to this question is yes. And what happened now? Is this in B normal form? Yes. It's still not in B C now, by the way, because both functions of density actually violates the B C N F part, meaning the right hand side is it's not a trivial function of density and the left hand side is not a key. Neither S nor C by itself is a key. So both have violated the B C N F requirement. However, now with this additional constraint, it satisfies BC in that requirement. Now, this simple yet tricky example tells us one thing, which is this redundancy, this particular redundancy, is not allowed in BC in that, but now it's allowed it's allowed in certain number. This basically, this discussion convinced you, I hope, that certain normal form is really a relaxation of BCNF, and it allows certain type of redundancy to exist in your scheme. The dependency on candidate key is really the key. In some sense, if I were to, if I, if I'm allowed to draw a graph to demonstrate this, right? If you think about, this is. <coughs> or attributes of R, of a given schema R. This is all attributes of a schema R. And this is attributes in a key. You follow what I'm drawing here? These are set semantics, OK? The fact that this is a key, what does it tell you? What does it tell you? It tells you this small circle, if I highlight this like this, this whole thing actually determines this big circle here. And that's because that's a key. Okay? And furthermore, it tells me if you choose any subset of it, any subset of it, this will not determine this whole thing. Otherwise, this cannot be a key. You can choose this black part as any way you want. You will never, this always hold, because otherwise this cannot be a key. You follow me? The part so good? What third normal form tells you is the following. Now I have x determined a, right? And a is part of some key. So let's say a is here. 
Let me get rid of this black part. So what I have is actually the following. So I'm going to have one attribute colors. Okay, fine. I'm going to use black again, but so this is one attribute. This is A. Right? One attribute. A single attribute, A. That's part of this part of this P. Okay? X determine A means that there is some X somewhere. This is X. Determine this this, this kind of dependency is okay for some normal form. Intuitively, why this is okay? Because there's a chain reaction in some sense. X determines this, and now this whole thing determines everything else. In other words, this, if this determines everything else, this must determine also X. So that form a chain reaction. In some sense. But the, the critical observation is this X only determines a single attribute or part of that. A is either a single attribute or a subset attribute on that key. This kind of dependency is fine. Intuitively, what I'm saying is the following, right? Imagine you have a key to open this door. What Sonoma form says is if someone else can partially determine the key that opened this door, then that kind of redundancy is, is all right. Because that kind of redundancy gives you some power, in a sense, to open the door. It doesn't enable you to open the door completely, but it gives you some power to open the door, to have a hope to open the door. That's kind of what some normal form is saying. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So that's the definition of thermal form. Now decomposition into some of from this slide onwards is not required. Okay. How do we decompose that? That's actually fairly tricky. It's not very easy to understand that algorithm. I will skip that. All you need to know is what thermal form is, why it's defined in that particular form, which we have done using this simple example of sailor reserve boat using credit card. Follow me? All of you? Okay. Fantastic. Now let's move on to switch gear and move on to something that's more system oriented. Okay? Basically you face number three. How many of you have any experience, you know, any level of experience with web programming? Fairly bit of you. Okay, good. So so that will help me quite a bit, but for the rest of you, don't worry, I will still cover essentially the, the, the essential part for you to be able to do it. Okay? So in particular, third normal form, we're going to use something called GSP. GSP stands for Java Circular Page. Okay? And why we use GSP? Why not PHP? Why not Ruby? Uh, why not some, some other web programming? Environment. I will explain that in a minute. And but I will give you a, a, a general overview, which is no matter what kind of web programming environment you are using, right? PHP, uh, ASP, Ruby. The underlying principle is the same. Is all the same. And to get started, we have to first understand the difference between a static web page and a dynamic web page. And to understand that, we need to understand how the request to a particular website is served. Okay? To begin with, we start with something called URL. URL stands for Universal Resource Locator. Sounds like a really fancy name, right? But essentially it's just a hash table. 
and URL is the key to a resource somewhere on the web. Right? That's kind of the way you can understand it. Right? It's just a key, like hash table key, for you to look up a particular resource on the web. Okay, for example, this is the URL, and this is another URL. Okay? And there is some complex process in place that will take a URL, which is a hash table key, and do the translation and mapping to a particular resource on the web. And this page you are looking at right now, it's nothing else but a particular resource you're loading from the web. Okay? So far so good? And there are different kind of resources on the web, and we're gonna focus on you know, HTML, HTML pages. HTML pages. Okay? HTML is Hypertext markup language. Hypertext markup language. Essentially, what it does is the following. Very, very simple. Okay? The basics of HTML. You have a bunch of tags that define the appearance of tags and images. That's it. Right? You have a bunch of tags to define the appearance of tags or images. For example, you can have something like this. What this does is to present this text called test in italic form when a web browser retrieves this. That's it. And you can generalize this to different kind of text. There are many, many different kind of text. But you got the idea, right? Some control you know, the looking of your text, italic, some control the looking of your images, the size of that image to be displayed, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's the basics of HTML. So far so good? Once you understand that, the next thing to understand is the difference between dynamic page and static page. Okay, can someone explain to me the difference of the two? What's a dynamic page? What's a static page? So the static page, like the HTML file is just sitting on a server, and you send the request, it sends back that uh, same. Uh huh. Same HTML page every time, dynamic page. Um, you request it at the server, it'll go through like some sort of routing protocol, um, query a database, and fill. It usually has some like, either like uh, ASP.NET uses Razor, render Ruby uses like Ruby HTML. Uh, kind of, right? Kind of. Let me elaborate more on what you said, right? The key difference of the two is the following. Okay? Get into this. Okay, what's the best way to explain this? But I want to give you something that you can connect to, or example that you can connect to. Okay? Uh, static page. Okay, the static page is nothing else but the HTML page that's hard-coded on the server. So when you retrieve that, you get the same page, same content, same looking back all the time. Unless somebody go and edit that page manually on the server. That's good? That's static page. So you look at the same page a million times, you retrieve that a million times, you will be getting back the same page all the time. Unless somebody on the server end added the page somehow. Then you will get a different page back. Static page. Dynamic page, the page itself may stay the same, meaning nobody ever change a single line or anywhere on that, on that page. However, the part of that page is rendered, the content of that part is rendered dynamically. Give you a simple example. Right? This is a static page, meaning no matter how many times you retrieve this, you always get, by retrieving this back, what do you get? You get something like this. You 
get an italic display. Unless somebody changed this to this, what do you get? B stands for both, so not only you got italic, you got both as well. However, somebody has to manually add this tag in order to display this effect. You follow know I me? Mean? Now, now that's the static page. What is, what is the dynamic page? I'll give you a really, really simple example. Okay, suppose I have the following. Again, task. But I'm gonna append this with a variable called date. Okay, pardon me my grammar here, right? This grammar may not work depending on the browser, right? Suppose this is rendered by a GSP page, right? So this is a variable date. Which means, whenever somebody retrieves this page from the server, server will render this using whatever programming environment you have, like PHP or GSP or Ruby, and replace this with the current timestamp on the server. You follow me? Yes or no? So the process is there's a client, there's a server, and on the server somewhere locate this page. And if, when client send a request to this page, in the static case, I will re reply this directly. In the dynamic page, this will go through a runtime environment. First, then return back to the server. And that runtime environment will evaluate this to whatever value it is now. In source, the code stays the same, the content of that page stays the same, nothing has changed. However, every time you request this, you get a different display at the client side, depending on the timestamp of your request. That's a simple illustration of dynamic page. You follow me? Okay? Now, dynamic page is kind of like you are invoking a program on the server side rather than just looking at a text file from the server side. The if you are looking at just a text file on your computer, that's kind of like retrieving a static page from the, from the server. Every time you look at the text file, it's going to be the same until somebody changes that text file. But that any page is kind of like locally you're invoking a program. The execution of that may depend on some variables of your input or system input, meaning the output of that program may be different, even though the program itself may stay the same. That's kind of like retrieving a dynamic page from the server. Do you follow me? Now, in this case, this dynamic page requires no input from the client because date is a system variable. So I require no input from the client. As you can imagine, using you know what, what I just said, if you want to do more sophisticated, fancier control, you will want to be able to supply some parameters to the server so that the same dynamic page may behave differently depends on what you supply to it. Kind of like when you invoke a program locally, the program should ask you for some input to direct its behavior. Pretty much like what you did in phase two, right? There is a menu for user to enter different parameter values, depending on the value input, different value input, the behavior of your program will be different. You follow me? In a local program, programming environment, that's easy, right? You use standard in, standard out to do that. Or you use a GUI interface to do that. In a web environment, how do you do that? Right? That's the next thing we need to understand. Once we understand that, you kind of know everything about dynamic page. The only thing left is what's that grammar to evaluate those dynamic components of a dynamic page. Obviously, that will be depending on the programming environment you are using, GSP, PHP, and so on. So forth. You follow me? So the next thing we need to understand is what is that parameter parsing mechanism we are supposed to use? Okay? So let's demonstrate that using example, right? So this is the website we built. If we look at, so we probably don't show. If you look at on the top, right? So this is the URL, Universal Resource Link Locator, as I said. 
the way that you pass a parameter to the server is exactly the secret is on the top. You look at there's a question mark there. You follow that? So whatever before the question mark is what we call the base of your URL. Base of your URL. Then after that is the parameter value pairs to that resource. That in this case, there's one parameter called person ID, and the value of that is a hash value. And then there's another there's the ampersand sign for you to append more parameters. So the second parameter is called BBLV equal to another value. So in this case, I'm parsing two parameter values to the server for server to function properly. And it, so this is a, one of the faculty's homepage that I can show you what happened if I click another one. You see, the structure of this stays the same, the only difference is the values are different. So I'm calling the same program, I'm, evo I'm evoking the same program, that PHP page, but now with the same parameters but with different values. Henceforth, the display you get as a concept will be different. That you are using the same program, but you're invoking that program with different values. And I guess that's literally all websites, how you know any website works. If you go to your Gmail, you log in, there is this thing. If you pay attention to what happened on the call. So far so good? Okay. So you understand this part. Now, the only thing left really is to understand. Now we understand how we pass parameters from client to the server. The only thing left is how the server interpret any such parameters and invoke a program. And that obviously depends on that particular runtime environment you are using. We're going to use GIP, drop a circular page as an example to demonstrate that. To do that, so here is the Tomcat uh, server I have set up. So each of you, the page is already up. Yeah, so let, let me see, I demonstrate this using user 28. And you click on this order.jsp, this render this GSP page to you. Now you can supply a query parameter to this form, submit. It will run a program called orders.jsp on the server side with two parameters. Search attribute equal login and value is user one. And that program will take these two parameters, execute a program, and return this output back to you. That makes sense? Let's do another test. Let's go back and supply this as user two. I'm using the same text box to supply that value. What do you get? Login for user two. You see, the URL stay the same, but my the first parameter is still the same is login. The second parameter becomes user two. You may wonder what what's the purpose of that first parameter. The first parameter is for me to figure out which search I'm doing, whether I'm searching by username or I'm searching by directory name. Let me try to do this with a different a different box. Kubrick is the directory name. You see, search attribute now become director, and attribute value become corporate. So that first attribute is for me to figure out, given the two text box to the user, which one the user is using. The second one is to tell me what is the value the user has supplied for that particular text box. So I can construct my queries differently. You understand, you know, in a nutshell what's going on here? That means that before I dive into the GSP details, we need to understand something called the concept of form. So form is a HTML tag. It's a particular type of tag from HTML that allow you to define a region of input. Region of input. Meaning that it defines a part of your HTML page to collect user input from the client. Within a form, you can supply many different types of inputs. You can have a text box, as we have here. You, have, you can have a drop-down list. You, have, you can have 
radio button for user to select. There are different type of inputs you can associate with the form. You follow me? In this case, we have two forms. The top form is a single text box, and that text box is name and login. And then the second form is search by director. That defines another text box. Of course, you can always you can also code this in a way that both text boxes are enclosed enclosed in the same form. That's also possible. But in this particular case, I'm using two separate forms uh, to demonstrate this now. Okay, so that's the backend HTML stuff. Now, before I show you the code in the backend, let me go over this GSP tutorial really quick. So GSP is the Java server page. It's a server-side programming technology right, that enables the rendering of dynamic pages. It's essentially that runtime environment I'm talking about. There are many different choices for this runtime environment. Uh, one particular choice is GSP. So GSP is a programming language. The runtime environment that can understand GSP is Tomcat. Tomcat is a server designed to understand GSP and Java server-side programming. Uh, so that's what I've been using. Okay? It's very similar to PHP, and it's the reason we use GSP for phase three is it seamlessly integrates your phase two code into GSP. What I mean by that? It allows you to embed Java code into HTML page by using this particular tag, opening tag with percent sign and close that tag with percent sign. Anything inside this pair is treated as your Java code. Meaning your Java code goes into this. And outside this, this tag, what, what happens? Well, it's your standard HTML page. So you can mix your HTML page code, the static code, with your dynamic code in the same page. Very easy by using just this. Okay? To give you an example, so this is the backend of the audio.gsp page. I have, so you can see this, let me turn off the light. Better now? Uh, you use a different, yeah, now it's better. So as you can tell, this is, you can ignore this JavaScript part. That's just a JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript is code to be executed at the client side, not to be executed at the server side. Okay? So I start with this tag called body. That's kind of the first tag of any almost any HTML page. Start with this. Then you look at this. This session simply defines a segment of Java code at that side. You know? As soon, as soon as the Java runtime environment on the server look at this, they will know this is a part of your Java code. And also this, this is your H standard HTML page. That defines a form. Right? In this case, I'm defining the input type text with, you know, with this particular uh, attribute name. So that translates to this form right here. That translates to this form right here. You follow me? So far so good? If you continue on that GSP code, you got the second form. So far so good? And then I continue another segment of Java code. The critical observation though is that if you look at this, this Java code, here I define a string attribute, and I define an if statement. There's an if statement with the opening bracket for that if statement. I never close that if statement right here. You follow me? The, the beautiful thing about GSP and similarly other server-side programming environment is that it allows you to mix Java code, the dynamic content of your page, in any way you like with static content. Meaning that the form definition, this whole thing, is part of your static code. 
becomes part of your if block. Become part of your if block until you 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 go to the end of the definition of your form and you close that if block. Uh, that's the closing bracket for that if block. And you start an else block here. You follow me? So the way you understand this is essentially ignore those static content and treat it as part of your, the continuation of your protocol. Essentially, that's how you look at it. If you think about it, this is really, really powerful. Because what it says is the dynamic, the static part of your page can be just the typical static code you have for an HTML page. <coughs> and you only need to write the minimal segment of code that control the dynamic part of your page. That's it. And another thing, really cool thing about GSP is, the, the immediate next question to ask is, does it mean I have to rewrite all the code I have in phase two inside this environment? Right? The answer is no. The really cool thing about GSP is that it allows you, in the dynamic part of your page, to make kind of like a function call to stand along Java class outside the Java server page. What does it tell you? That tells you most of your logic should be included in some stand along Java classes for easy debugging and development purposes, like you have done in your phase two. And your GSP page only contain minimum level of dynamic code to control the logic flow of what class and what function to call, instead of coding everything in your GSP. You follow that? That's number one. Number two, the second observation is the following, which is for your phase three, because of that, you can reuse all the code you have done for your phase two. All you are doing in some sense in phase three is to build a manual system using a web GUI interface. The logic of each function item should have already been implemented by your phase two code. All you're, all you're doing is from a web GUI interface to call those functions. That's all you're doing, to call those classes. To understand that, if you allow me to go to the top of this GSP page, notice that there is a directive called page, language Java. This, this is to define some page level variables, meaning for this particular page, my language to interpret this is Java. And I'm importing this particular class, this package. That's kind of like your phase two package. And once you have imported this code, then in your GSP code, you can then you can do things like this. This would Familiar to you, right? Connector is that same class from your phase two. And order is another class I have implemented in my code. In other words, inside your GSP, you can new Java classes just as if you are in a standard standard Java environment. So instead of having complex logic in your GSP, you never never do that. You push those complex application logic into your standalone Java code, and in GSP, you only call to control the flow of it. That makes sense? So that's how you reuse all your phase two code. The last thing, the next thing, not last thing, I will continue on Wednesday, but I, want, I do want to finish this before I let it go, is in order for your GSP code to do this, these classes must be somehow visible to you, visible to the server, right? Server needs to know how to interpret this order or connect the class. In other words, when I define this import on top, I need to know, I being the server, need to know where to import that class. Where does it locate at on the server, right? That is predefined already. I have set up the server in a particular way for each of your team to tell the server to load from a particular location. So that all been taken care of for you. All you need to do is go to this folder called public underscore HTML on Georgia. So once you log in with your SSH account, 
then go to web and app, then there's the, there's the folder called classes. Don't make any change to this structure. If you change any of this, it will mess up with the server. Server will not be able to load your code. And this is where you place your phase two code, including the jar file. And once you do this, from that GSP page, you can see everything you have done from your phase two. And all you are doing, essentially, is to replace the manual system in phase two with a number of GSP pages to direct the control flow and call your phase two code. That's it. So far so good? So that's the basics of phase three. I will continue to wrap up a few more details on one thing. Okay? I will release this today. I will give you detailed instructions on that. Oh, so why don't you use